Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. To all of you tuned in online also, we greet you to our noonday Bible study. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be in your house and to learn from your word. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do in our lives. We ask you to speak to us today, Lord, through your word like only you can. We give you the glory for what you're doing in our lives, what you're doing in our church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. All right, let's go to Matthew chapter 5. So um, just kind of continuing on here as we get a chance to take some lessons out of the Sermon on the Mount. And then so um, just as a quick review, of course, the Sermon on the Mount starts in Matthew chapter 5 here, and we the well, first part of this is that Jesus is speaking about what it means to be citizens of the kingdom or citizens in heaven. And he talks about the blessings attached to that, as you see there in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and so on and so forth. Um, then he talked about citizens of the kingdom of heaven are also those that um, are the salt of the earth, right, and the light of the world. And he talked about that portion and uh, its value. Uh, and then he dealt with, uh, like in verse 17 on down a little bit there, he talked about how he, he transitions here, and he's really saying that I did not come to destroy the law, but I came to fulfill the law, which means now that he is going to change or really to bring light to the law because what happened was through time, uh, some of the teachings of the Pharisees and others were getting away from the principles of the law, right? They were imparting their own interpretation, which is known as traditional uh, aspects of the law or oral tradition. And some of those oral traditions of the law did not line up with the law. But because the people viewed the Pharisees as the teachers of the law, they took those things to mean whatever it is the Pharisees said. So Jesus is letting them know because he's saying, I'm getting, ready to, I'm getting ready to correct all that, but I'm here to fulfill it. I'm not here to destroy the law because it could come across that way, especially to the Pharisees. And so, and so he deals with that a little bit, and he deals with it much more during his sermon. But then it, it's interesting what he says in verse 20, and this is where we'll be today, Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. He says, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter in to the kingdom of heaven. So, <laughs> this is pretty big because if Jesus is speaking to this crowd they view the Pharisees as their religious leaders, and they're the ones who are going, they're teaching them about what the law is, what it means, and what they need to fulfill. Now, Jesus says, you have to exceed their righteousness, right? As citizens of heaven, citizens of the kingdom, you're going to have to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, right? Or else you can't be a citizen of heaven. You can't be a citizen in the kingdom. And he goes on really into the rest of this sermon to explain what that means. Um, and so that is vital, and it seems very challenging, right? And, of course, we're talking about here the righteousness of Jesus Christ, right? In other words, we could say that he's saying this, that you must follow the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And... As it goes later, as, of course, we receive salvation, we, we receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ through salvation in Christ. So we have to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Jesus here is teaching then a contrast of what real righteousness in the kingdom is compared to the traditional interpretation of how the Pharisees applied the law. And so he says this with a strong warning. You have to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. That's pretty strong. And so we need to know, Jesus, what are you saying? What are you telling us? Okay. 
So to understand that, we need to look at then what Jesus is talking about as it relates. What is the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees? What is their righteousness? Since we have to exceed that, we need to know what is that. And so let's go to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. And in Matthew chapter 23, starting in verse 1, and I'll go ahead and read here. Uh, to seven, just for the purpose of flow here, and we're going to kind of break this down. So in Matthew chapter 23, starting in verse 1, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to the disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore, whosoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not you after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens that are grievous to born and lay them on men's shoulders, and they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men, they make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. And they love the uttermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogue. And greetings in the markets to be called the men, to be called of men, rabbi, rabbi. Now, there's two things here that Jesus is, well, there's more than two things. There's many things here he's bringing out. And so this is important to know because this is what we have to exceed, right? And so you really see, you see a wrong attitude is really what you see here that the Pharisees had here. So... Notice that he starts out saying that the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, right? So they sit in the seat of what they would consider the lawgiver. Moses is the lawgiver. The problem was is that they didn't always just give the law of Moses. They also gave interpretation. Right? It's one thing to instruct. This is what the law of Moses says. But it's another to bring in what you want the scripture to say. Or your personal interpretation of the scripture. Because, and this happens today. We can, everything that Jesus is saying here, we can see it happening today. And that is when someone will twist the scripture to benefit themselves, and then it begins to lose its original meaning from God, right? How many times have you heard, like, oh, yeah, but it, it don't really mean that? Or we may even say about ourselves, well, God knows what I struggle with, so it doesn't mean that for me. No, the law is the law. The word is the word. The commands are the commands, right? So you might need help, right? I'm going to need help to help me to carry some things out, that the word tells us to do, but you can't change it. And this is exactly what they did. So he says here that they sit in Moses' seat. They sit themselves as Moses, as the lawgiver, because they're interpreting it the way they wanted it to be interpreted. And they're getting away from the original meaning that God gave the law for Moses to teach. He says... All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe. What's he saying there? He's saying there, this is amazing, he says, do what they tell you to do according to the law. Now he's not saying here to do what their false interpretation is, but do what they say do according to the law. That's important. So what does that mean? And, and this is even true today. This is true today. Oftentimes when the word is being preached, or this can be true even in prophecy, and it is this, that you have to know scripture enough to what? To receive the meat and spit out the bone. Right? Because what happens is, this happens to me too, this, uh, the preacher is preaching, uh, the prophet is prophesying, whatever it might be, it passes through the filter of our flesh, our humanity, of what we are, and what comes out on the other end may not be 100% the Word of God. It might be 90%. Ten of it might be some fluff. Ten of it might have been some personal personality or something. 
And in some cases, a portion of it may be completely false. Because they want to do, amen, they want you to receive it. They wanted it done their way. And so they add to the scripture, which shouldn't have been added for their own personal preference. Right? And so, so this is really Jesus saying, so do what the law says. Okay? So the things they teach you concerning the law, Jesus says, do that. But don't follow them after they works. For they say and do not. In other words... The word they bring forth and the interpretation they bring forth, they don't even follow it themselves. He says, so don't follow their works. That's that's pretty amazing for Jesus to say that. He's saying, do what the Pharisees say to do, but don't look to them to be an example of that because they don't even do what they teach. That's pretty deep, huh? And so what do you see that? Do you see that today? Are, are, are there actually pastors and preachers and teachers and prophets, they'll tell you to do certain things, but they won't live up to it themselves? They don't strive to live it also? We see that today. And here's what's amazing about this word. It says something about the power of God's word is that even with someone who doesn't have the intention to follow the word, speaks the word, and doesn't follow it himself or herself, the word still has power to change lives. Because the power is in the word, not in the person who's bringing the word. So Christ is really saying here, observe that word. That word is going to help you, but the person bringing the word, don't follow what they do, because they don't even follow what the word says. Right, So now we're getting an idea here of what it means to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. We have to be followers of the word of God and not necessarily the person who's bringing the word forth. Right? Uh, did, have you ever done that as a parent? Do as I say, not as I do. Uh, have you ever said that or your parents told you that? You know, yeah, that's the perfect example, really, right? And so we see that all the time, right? We see that all the time. Yeah, I see that with, here we are again, talking about grandchildren, but you know what? Um, they, They don't give our grandson sugar. He has no taste for sugar, right? Even, even the two birthdays he's had, he has no interest in the cake, right? Because it doesn't taste right to him. Now, now, now you put some watermelon in front of him and some grapes in front of him, he'll eat that. He likes good natural type of food because that's how he's been trained, right? And so, but, you know, if he comes around me, and he looks at something that has sugar in it, and I tell him, no, you can't eat that, but then I'm eating it. You see that? Now, right now, he's only two and a half, but when he gets older, he'll say, but you're eating it, right? There it is, right? So our example has to be, if I tell you to do it, I should be doing it also. Yeah. So he goes on, therefore, he says, uh, so don't follow their works, Right? Follow what they do according to the law. Verse 4, Matthew 23 and 4. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born, lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. They, they would go to the people and they would say, this is what the law tells you to do and put burdens on them. Their interpretation of the law was this, is that you... Amen. Have to pay taxes, tithes of certain kinds that weren't under the law to have to pay, right? They would put extra burdens on them. You need to pay a temple tax. You need to pay a rabbi tax, all in the name of God, okay? And they would just burden the people. But it says, Jesus says, they wouldn't even lift one of their fingers to help them. You have to do it, but I don't have to do it. 
All right, and that's because this comes a little bit later in the message because you can see these Pharisees had a love for money more than they had a love for God, right? So he's talking about heavy burdens. When we're talking about burdens, right, the analogy here that we could use is when you uh, burden up an animal like a camel. You're throwing this heap of stuff on them to the point where they're collapsing, Jesus is really saying here, but you won't even carry one bag to take the burden off them. You don't even help out at all. You, you just burden and put the burdens on the people, but you carry no burden for yourself. And later on in this, this sermon, Jesus says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Right? So be yoked with me, Jesus told them. So, so think about that. If we are to receive the righteousness of scribes and Pharisees, then don't put a burden on someone else that you won't bear yourself. Right? Make their yoke easy just as you want it to be easy. You want your burdens to be light, make their burdens light. 23 and 5. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries, and enlarge the borders of their garments. Jesus now is looking at the heart of the Pharisee. He says, I want you to exceed this. Don't do things just to be seen of people, the approval of people, the esteem of people. Right? They're doing it not for God. They're doing it to make themselves appear better than others and appear to be more righteous. So notice what he says here. They make broad their phylacteries. Phylacteries are those, they were little boxes with leather strips on them, leather ties if you will. And so when they would go into prayer, you wore this phylactery on your forehead and you tied it like a headband, but that box would be right here. And inside that box were some specific scriptures that you would tuck in that box, right? And then you also could wear one on your arm. <laughs> Jesus is saying here, that they make them broad. That's kind of funny to me because, you know, how big of a box can you get on your forehead? And then you tie it. But he says they made their boxes bigger to appear to be more righteous. Like, ooh, he must have more scriptures in his box. His prayers must be longer or deeper. That's what they were trying to envision or having a big box on your arm, right, tied to your arm. This is the kind of stuff they would do. Jesus says you have to exceed that. And this is dealing with the heart. And they enlarge the borders of their garments. So uh, rabbis, and even Jesus would have done this. They, they wear that, that outer robe that has that tassel on it, right? That has the blue line running through it, right? There's a significance of there of being attached to God. And most, most Jewish men would wear them. Uh, but the rabbis... They would make those larger. So, you know, you might have a two to three inch tassel. You know, they got a six inch one. They're making theirs larger because they're, they're saying to everybody, I'm better than you. Right? So they're showing off, what are they doing here? They're showing off, right, the outer appearance to appear to be spiritual. But really, they're far from being spiritual. It's called self-righteousness. And so Jesus says then that we have to exceed that. Verse 6, they love the uppermost rooms at feast and the chief seats in the synagogues. Oh, my. So whenever they would have a feast of some kind, the way they ate in those days, they, they would have tables that were very close to the ground. They they weren't allowed to sit and eat. You had to actually recline on what they would call a couch, but it would be, if, if you only had a table this high, then basically it was cushions that were around this table. Oftentimes the, the tables were kind of U-shaped, right? So the purpose was is that as you reclined on one side or the other, your feet would be away from the table. And that's how you would eat. So it required or meant that you would have great fellowship with those who you're eating with because you're, you know, you're all kind of leaning on each other almost, right? Uh, we see that, for instance, at the Last Supper, it says that John, what, he had his head on Jesus' bosom. 
right? Because think about that. They weren't sitting at tables and chairs. They were reclining on couches, if you will, you know, deep cushioned around the table as they were eating. Um, so that's how they would eat. So what would happen, though, there would be, in these feast rooms, there would be head tables, right, where the dignitaries were. And he says, so they love to be in those settings, those, those rooms of feasting, right, that had the nicest furnishings and the thickest couches and amongst the greatest leaders of their day. That's, what they, that's where they love to be. They strove for that and believe they deserved it. And the chief seats in the synagogue. So the chief seats in the synagogues means that even though the, the, what resembled the Ark of the Covenant might be behind them, they wanted to sit in seats in front of the Ark of the Covenant that looked down at the people. Right? They wanted the people to esteem them when really they should have been esteeming God and all that, but they put themselves in that position. And so they wanted those seats. They didn't want to sit down on the floor, right? Now, these are the kind of things that I got, if you all know me, I'm kind of sensitive to, right? You, you're never going to see me robed up, right? You're never going to see me in these robes with the crosses and a cross around my neck and, you know, in my pocket next to my heart. You know, those who do that, I love you. I can't do it. It's just my personal conviction or whatever. And oftentimes it's because some of it is just done with the wrong attitude, the wrong heart. Now, some people love that. They, they want their pastor to come out, right, in their crushed velvet red robe and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you, you're just not going to get that with me. But there's some congregants who love that kind of stuff. They, oh, look at my pastor's robe today and, and all that kind of stuff. And when I would ask pastor, well, you know, why do you wear a robe? Oh, it saves my suits. But you're still taking that robe to the cleaners every week. You're sweating the robe out, and that's still costing you, you know, even more to have dry clean. And, you know, they didn't want nothing to do with me. Some of them, though, do it to appear, right, more religious, closer to God. Right? So they have three rings on their fingers and amen and the big cross and collared up and all that kind of stuff. And one of the reasons I can't do that is because I come from a Catholic background that did all that. I ain't going there. I don't see it in New Testament scripture. Okay. Um, but for those who, you know, go on with your bad self is what I say, but not me. So this is what they love to do. They love to have the adornment and the dress and the big boxes and, and sitting up in front of the people. But we know what Jesus is teaching here about these Pharisees is they did it for what? They did it for the approval of the people and made them feel good, made them feel uh, more righteous in that they had power over the people. I'm better than you. Jesus says we have to exceed that. And in the greetings in the marketplaces, they love to be called of men, rabbi, rabbi. So in the marketplace or whatever, they love for men to say, you know, running by, Rabbi Mark, it's good to see you. Which means what? They love their titles. They love their titles. Whenever you have someone who you call them and not by their title and they have a problem with you, they're not exceeding the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Me personally, I don't need a title. My name is Mark. Call me Mark, right? Um, that's not just respecting who I am. It doesn't respect the, the, the calling I have, the office I hold is, as it relates to God of the fivefold ministry of being a pastor teacher. You know, that just because someone gives you a title doesn't take away what God has given you. But for some, you call them outside of their title, yeah, they're going to have a problem. In fact, they'd rather just have you call them by their title. You don't even have to mention their name. Just say, hey, Archbishop, they're good with that. Yeah. 
And so Jesus says we have to exceed that, right? So that's what it means. And, and so what we see here is it deals with the heart. Jesus in this sermon, is he's dealing with the heart, he's using the Pharisees who have, are supposed to be the ones that have the heart for the people and have the heart for the law, but they've gotten away from that for their own righteousness, not, not to live by the righteousness of Christ. So Jesus is saying here what? He's saying here, do what they say, not what they do. And he's showing us the condition of their heart to not do things to be seen of men. Exceed the righteousness. Don't do things because you're going to be seen of men. And then what's going to happen? And then they're going to praise you. And then you have your reward. All right. What else can we look at? Let's go to Matthew chapter 23. Um, Matthew 23. So we're going back a little bit. Verse 23 and 24. Matthew 23, 23 and 24. Jesus is saying here, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Jesus was straight up with them, right? But he's telling the truth. Hypocrites. For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and you have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These you have ought to have done, but not to leave the other undone. You blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. So Jesus is calling him out, right? And he's doing it for the benefit of his disciples and the people who might have been there listening so that they can see what it is he is saying. And so... This is interesting because what, the, what they would do is they, when, when the spring garden came up, if you will, right, they would even take bits of the herbs, 10% of their herbs, I don't know how you calculate that exactly, but, and they would take it to the priests to say, I even paid tithes. Of my mint leaves. That's what they're doing. And so they were known for this, obviously, because Jesus is bringing it up. Now, here's the thing. That wasn't required under the law. Under the law, yes, tithing was required, but it was like of, of your major crops, your corn, your wheat, your oil, those type of things. But, but to, to tithe of your little herb garden wasn't even required by the law but their interpretation was we do this and we do it because we exceed the law to make themselves appear more righteous and so this is the things that Jesus was talking about and so he's saying here and so what happens though but you then you do that okay you do that you do that with the right heart that's not necessarily a bad thing not required by the law but that's not necessarily a bad thing but what but here's the problem but then you omit the, the weightier matters, the more important matters of the law, which is judgment, mercy, and faith. You, you, you're willing to give of your mint leaves, but you don't live by judgment, mercy, and faith. You don't teach on that. You don't live by that. And those, that's what the law is all about. Jesus is saying that we need to exceed that, right? Yes, there is a judgment of God, but here's the beauty of God. He is merciful, right, to forgive us, to love us, to even come and die for us. And all of that is accessed by faith in God, not our own righteousness. So, if, you know, people who have an attitude of a Pharisee have a tough time coming to God because coming to God is saying, I need a savior. It takes humility. And if you think you're all right or you can get it right on your own, you won't exercise faith in God. You have faith in yourself. But we have to admit we need mercy. And so those things are the things that should have been taught. It's all in the law. Those are the things that should have been taught. 
He says, you should have, Jesus said, you should have done that and then leave the other undone. You know, keep your mint leaves and teach on this is really what Jesus is saying here. So that's vital that we can see here. So Jesus is saying that, you know, don't neglect the law. Don't neglect, especially the weightier matters of the law. The, if you're going to practice some of the light matters of the law or even things that necessarily aren't in the law, you could find a principle for it maybe, but don't neglect the, the more important things of the law. And so we have to make sure that we don't do the same. We, we can get focused on what we feel we're good at as it relates to obeying God's word, and then we omit the other things that perhaps have greater importance. We need to eat the whole roll, right? Eat it all, okay? So one way that that can be interpreted is they majored in minors. They majored in minors is what they did. And they minored in majors, right? And so that's not good. And then let's go to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, I'm going to read it to you in, in a different version. Luke 16, 13 through 15. It says, no servant can serve two masters, for either will hate the one or love the other. Else he'll be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon, of course, is money, right? Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard all these things, and they derided him. So Jesus, of course, is cutting right to the heart. And so the Pharisees, the scripture says here that they derided him for saying that. Derided means that they laughed at him and they scorned at him with contempt, right? They considered the words of Jesus worthless because it didn't line up with what they wanted. So he said to them, you are those who justify yourself before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. I love the way Jesus just gives it to them. You justify yourself before men. It's easy to justify yourself before men because here's why. You can always find someone who's doing something worse than you. So you justify yourself by comparing yourself to others. Right? He says that's what you do, but that don't work with God because God can look right at the heart. He knows the condition of the heart. And so what you consider highly esteemed by men is abomination to God. Because God can, can truly see, right? So what does this say? That we have to exceed that. We, we can't be lovers of money, right? In other words, mammon, you can't, you can't love money to that point, right? It is the, the root of all evil. Do we need money? Yes. We need money. Therefore, because we need money, yeah, I like money. Because money helps us get what we need. Right? But you can't put money above your love for God. That's really what that is saying when we say we're lovers of money. We have a greater dependency upon money. We have a greater dependency upon what money can do as opposed to what God can do. And it's always interesting to me because the only way that you can acquire real money is God owns everything, so God has to give it to you, or you still have to operate by a biblical principle to obtain this is why those are in the world that don't know God, they can still achieve a lot of money. Why? Because they, they work hard for it. That's a biblical principle. They work for the money. They, they found a place where they've acquired a trade. They've, they've taught themselves or they've been taught to go out and to earn money. And then they take that money and then they invest it. Over time it invests and it grows. All those are biblical principles. Right? Those who are lovers of money, they put money above God, they're trying to get rich quick. Even if that means defrauding somebody. And how many times have, has that happened where you find out someone's going to jail because they were able to get people to invest in their, quote, scheme, and they started paying them 15, 20% a month, but eventually that runs out. Because what they were doing is they were taking new money that they were bringing in 
to pay out the early investors 20%, but after a while, the new money dries up, and so you can't pay the 20%, then the whole thing collapses because they're taken from it, and, and they're living high. They're buying houses and cars and yachts and everything else, and then what happens? They get found out, they end up in court, they go to jail. Happens all the time. Happens all the time. And people are attracted to, wow, look how wealthy he is. Look how great his office is. Look how this, it must be real. I got my first check for 20%. I'm going to put more into this. And then what happens? You lose it all. You've lost all your principal. You've been defrauded. That's someone who operates trying to get rich quick under the love of money. That's not a biblical principle. And so... Jesus is saying what? Now, so we see here all these things that the scribes and Pharisees did. We have to exceed that. We have to exceed that. So what he's saying is this. The righteousness of the kingdom as citizens of heaven, the righteousness of the kingdom demands more from us. It demands more from us. Okay? So let's look at this. Let's go to... Let's back up, back to, over to where our Sermon on the Mount is. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. In Matthew 7, 21, Jesus says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. And he goes on to talk about, Things that they say they have done. Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out devils in your name? Right? Didn't in your name we do many wondrous works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So what's he saying here? It's the same thing that to exceed the righteousness of Pharisees, what? We cannot just say it and then do not. So what this is Jesus is saying here is, I never knew you. In other words, your heart was never surrendered to me. You operated what you thought in the kingdom for the benefit of yourselves. That's deep. But how many times do we hear, uh, unfortunately, but those who are gifted by God, they preach, they, they, they build, they can build big churches or big TV ministry, right? And they, they're bringing in all this kind of money and they got airplanes and yachts and all this kind of stuff and then the whole thing collapses or they get caught in a scandal and everything collapses on them. It says something about somewhere along the line their heart wasn't right anymore and they got caught up in all the stuff. Right? No matter how much God blesses us, right, we have to keep doing what the kingdom tells us to do. We need to keep keep operating the way Jesus told us to operate. You can't allow those things to happen because then Jesus says, you, you were never. I was never your Lord. You were never surrendered to me. You took my gifts, you took my talents, you took my abilities, and you used my name to go forth and do stuff, but you never did it for me. You did it for yourself. That's what the Pharisees did. You see? So, so he's saying here that we, we need to not have that same type of attitude of saying and do not. You can't do that. Okay? And so then that means that we can't do things that are just seen of men. Right? Matthew 6 and 1. Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Oh, man. Where do we see stuff like this? You see it in, you can see it in churches all the time. You're not going to see it here. And that's not the way we were brought up here, right? But to be seen of men, okay? All right, we're going to have... Uh, the $100 line in the middle, all those are going to give $100. You get in the middle line, okay? And then the $50, well, now it's $500 lines and $400 lines. And so people will get up and give their $500, and everyone's looking at it like, wow, he's giving $500. That's exactly 
what this is talking about. We don't do things to be seen of men. We don't do things to be seen of others. We don't do things to, to receive the gratitude of people. That's not our purpose. Now, if gratitude comes and people say, thank you for doing this, thank you for doing that, that's wonderful, but that's not our motive for doing them. We should appreciate one another. We should appreciate sacrifice when we see it, but that's not our motive for what we do. That's not, where, that's not why we're citizens of heaven. We're not trying to receive from people. We, we want to please our Lord, right? So he says, make sure that you don't do your giving before men. Alms oftentimes has to do with giving to those who are less fortunate than you. So you don't do that, but that can apply to any type of giving, to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father, which is in heaven. The promises of the reward that comes to the citizens of the kingdom will not be yours because you did it with the wrong attitude. Now, will the person that you're giving and helping that is less fortunate than you be blessed? Absolutely. They're blessed either way. But what you would receive from God can't be received now. You have your reward. You have your reward. And so this even comes to more light in the, in, in the day we live in because we have social media and we have video and pictures that we can take all the time. And so, you know, you see this with politicians. They go out and do something uh, to help others and say they were a part of it. And, and they have their publicists there taking pictures of them, giving someone some food. And then they have fallen. They have fallen. Amen. We see that recently with one of our own. Um, what's his name? Missouri, who's that? What's the gentleman's name that was here? Nathan Fletcher. Pray for Nathan. I think Nathan really has a good heart. But y'all have been watching the news what happened to Nathan Fletcher. Right. But he was out here, publicist, right? Good heart, really, passing out. And now, you know. The shame and, and some reconstruction that needs to go on in his life. And he's, he's moving up the ladder in politics, right? And so there's something about his heart that wasn't completely right. And he, he succumbed to the pressures of life, perhaps, and temptation. I'm praying for him. But that's exactly the kind of thing that can happen if we don't stay connected to God and stay humble, right? Think you can go out there and have anything? It's because of what you do. You better do it for the Lord, right? You better do it with the right heart. Um, so we don't do what we do to be seen of men. We cannot neglect any commandments of God's law. Ooh, Matthew 5, 19. Jesus said, Whosoever there shall break one of the least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So he says, don't even break the least of these commandments and don't teach people to do so. Right? This, this happens all the time, too. This happens like, you know, you don't, you don't really need to give all that. I only give this much. So you should, you know, you don't give all that. Keep that for yourself. God knows. No, if you're not going to do it, don't tell someone else not to do it either. Okay? And that's what he's saying. Even to the very least of the commandments, don't teach them to do the least or less than the least. Because then you're going to be least in the kingdom of heaven. But do them and teach them. And the same will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Right? If you're fulfilling it, teach by example. That's what he's really saying here. Go forth and others are watching. Teach by example. You don't have to publicize it. People are watching how you live in your life. Right? So we can't neglect any of the commandments as the Pharisees did. They picked and choose. Right? And then um, Matthew 6 and 24, which I've kind of already dealt with. No man can serve two masters. You'll hate the one or love the other, or else you'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in mammon or God in money. We cannot be lovers of money, not in the kingdom. 
Not as citizens of heaven, right? The king owns everything. King Jesus owns all of it. We want, we need something. He already sees it. But what do we do? We ask him and he'll make a way. He'll make a way, right? So this is a great warning for us if we think we're faithful criticisms. Uh, faithful citizens of the kingdom, right? These are good things to check ourselves. See, because you can't be a citizen of the kingdom, but you do not combine your profession of faith with suitable deeds, right? We're, we are known, Scripture says, by our works. That's how we are known. We are known by our works. Let me read it for you in James chapter 2. If you're taking notes, James chapter 2, 14 through 17. What does it profit my brethren if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If your brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you says to him, depart in peace, be warmed and be filled. But you do not give them the things that are needy for the body. What does it profit you? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, it is dead. <laughs> James really broke it down, right? He made it very simple. James is saying there, someone comes to you and they haven't eaten, right? And you have a wherewithal to, to give them something to eat. But instead you just say to them, go on. Go on and be blessed with food. And you didn't help them with any food? He says, that's just, that's just talk. You might have had faith in them. Just keep on going, and you're going to receive a blessing. I see it. I see it. Two blocks down, you're going to receive a blessing. And you might have said that sincerely in faith, but James said that means nothing. Not when you have the wherewithal to help them. Your faith is useless because faith without works is dead. That's deep, huh? It's so simple, but at the same time, it can be deep because we can catch ourselves doing little things like that in little ways in certain situations and circumstances. So that, that is important that we look at that. So James really breaks it down right there. You can't say you're citizens of heaven then and then not have a profession of faith that you don't follow what works, Right? You can't be a citizen of heaven if you do not keep your personal private lives consistent with their public appearance and profession. And that really speaks of, you know, when you go out and you're showing to be something, right, as a citizen of heaven, as a kingdom, but behind closed doors you're something else. All right, because again, God sees the heart. And so that's what the Pharisees oftentimes did. They did things for public appearance. And so outside, they look great, but inside. Jesus said one time that uh, you are men in, in dead men's graves, right? Dead men's bones, right? And so what the Pharisees would actually have done is they would make sure that they had left money behind after they died so that someone, family members or someone, would make sure that their tombstone, their sepulcher, right, was whitewashed on a regular basis that it wouldn't decay because it says this was a righteous person. And Jesus says, yeah, you have whitewashed tombs, but inside you're just dead man's bones. That's the kind of stuff he told the Pharisees, right? You're just rotting dead bones. But there again, even after you're dead, you're concerned about how you look on the outside. Ooh, look at that white glistening grave marker. Man, he's been dead 20 years now. Yeah, but his gravestone, whoo, he must have been a righteous man. No, he got a righteous painter, but he wasn't a righteous man. Yeah. Also, we're citizens of the kingdom, but do not make diligent effort to observe all that Jesus commanded. We fall short, right? Um, a classic one on this would be uh, John John chapter 8, 31 and 32. Let me go there real quick. He says, Jesus said unto the Jews which believe on him, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. 
All right, continue in my word, continue in my teaching, continue with everything that I have taught you, right? Then that truth of living in that word will keep you free. It'll set you free. And of course, we can't be enticed by materialism, as we have already said. Amen. So as we're concluding here, okay, we, must, we see here just some examples, the the Sermon on the Mount, as we continue to go on through it, we'll see here that Jesus is really bringing out this contrast more and more of what it means to be a citizen as a, and the righteousness of the kingdom to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees as we go on. And he begins to correct some of that interpretation that was, that was erroneous by the Pharisees. But what this says here in our lesson today, Jesus is teaching us that we must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. What do we mostly see with that? If, if we're just going to apply that in a quick way, how can I see the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees? Well, it's about this. It's focusing on your heart being close to the Lord. That's it. That's it. You see, when the heart is right, then you don't have to have a lot of rules and regulations. Right? Because there are certain things concerning your heart that you won't do to hurt somebody if you care about somebody. If you love them, we don't have to tell you. No one has to tell me, okay, not to hit my wife. If I ever raise my hand at my wife, knives would be flying toward me, I'm sure. Amen. I would not want to, amen, get in a scuffle with this woman. I know she's all nice and meek, but, man, you push her in a corner, just like everybody, you're going to see something different. Right? But you don't have to tell me that. Why? Because I love her. I would never think of doing that. Right? And so the same thing is true in our relationship with God. We, we don't need a really a whole lot of rules and regulations. We, we need them sometimes to, to guide people. But it's the same thing. This happens in church. And, and you see this oftentimes in uh, younger generations that grow up in church. And then they begin to see as they get older, they get to those teenage years. Now they start talking about all the hypocrisy they have seen through the years, even in their own parents. They see how they are at church, and then they see how they are not in church. And they say, something ain't lining up, right? It says something about the heart. When you love God, right, you're, you're still trying to live a life that's pleasing to God even when nobody is looking. Right? It's about your relationship with the Lord. And as that relationship grows, we become more like Christ. Right? All of that gets easier. You don't have to tell people, don't, don't do this, don't do that. Don't wear that. Don't, yeah. Because, amen, you, you can get convicted yourself. Before you leave the house, when you look in the mirror, God can convict you. If you, if you notice me, you know, I'm, um, you know I, wear, I wear shirts. Even if I'm not going to wear a tie, you know, they're, they're going to be buttoned pretty high, right? I don't know how you all would feel if I came in here, right, and I had it opened all the way down to my chest, and I'm showing off my chest, right? Right? Well, one time I, I put a shirt on, right, and I'm before the mirror, and, and, and it wasn't really low, but it wasn't as high as normally I would wear it. And it was just a little lower. And quite frankly, I was convicted. I was convicted. Like, I can't come before the people like this. This is either button it up and put on a tie or change your shirt. Right? Now, I, God didn't tell me you better change your shirt and all that. Right? The conviction of the Holy Spirit was already in me. You're not representing the right way. And I was uncomfortable when I looked in the mirror. I said, man, I really wanted to wear that shirt. It goes good with this. But I was convicted. And so that's what happens. There's, there's another law that is written in our heart when we are citizens of the kingdom, right? And so, but some may look at this and say, well, Pastor, I don't know. I don't think I can live up to all this because I'm prone to mistakes. I'm prone to selfishness sometimes. I, I don't have your conviction. I, I'm not sure I can do this. 
right? Well, that's why we need Christ. That's why we need his mercy. That's why we need his strength, right? Jesus is saying, take my yoke upon you, right? Learn of me. The beauty about Christ is he'll teach you as you go. He, he develops these convictions. He develops these ways of pleasing him that you're not going to get all at once. You're not going to get them all at once. It takes time to develop them. And so what do, we, what do we have then to rely on? He knows our heart. He knows if we're striving, we make mistakes. So what does he have to make up the difference? It's his grace. It's his mercy. Thank you, Jesus. He, he will give us strength if we're willing to be strengthened. If we're humble enough to say, God, I need your help in this area of my life. I, I know this is wrong and I'm trying to overcome it, but there's some things going on in me that, that keep pushing me or leading me that way, and I just give in to it, knowing that it's wrong, but I do it. Lord, I need your help. I need your help. And grace and mercy and strength come in, and he helps us. Here's one thing I found out about God. He doesn't waste anything. He don't waste anything. You know, we'll talk about our experiences that he doesn't waste, but, but let's be honest. Sometimes it's even our bad experiences that he doesn't waste. Now, how is that possible? Because of grace and mercy. He had grace in that area. He had mercy in that area. As you get older and as we get older and grow in the Lord, what do we do? We're, we're, we're supposed to acquire the wisdom of God, right? We acquire wisdom just through experiences in life. And when you see someone younger and they're about to make a decision, right, you can impart to them your wisdom. But, but here's the impart, impartation of wisdom. It's not always because you made the right decision. You're helping them to make the right, the right decision. Sometimes, look, don't make this decision because I did that, and here's what happened to me. It didn't come out good. But that's still wisdom. You're imparting to them wisdom of what not to do. Thank you, Jesus. But because of God's grace and God's mercy. And even if they go forth, and they make the wrong decision, and it causes them hurt, pain. Then you got to come right behind them and say, "Okay, well now, bring it to God. Let Him apply His grace and His mercy into your life. Yes, you, you're going to deal with some consequences now because of that, but it's not going to stop your growth from God. And God's going to use your mistake to help you grow. Now, I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of pastors who won't teach that because they don't want anyone to make any mistakes." They feel like it's a license for people to go make a mistake. No, you're still going to deal with the consequences. You just deal with the consequences in grace, but you're still going to deal with it. There's a lot of people operating in grace that are doing life in prison. They're dealing with a consequence, right? Forgiven, heaven bound, but dealing with the consequences of what they did. So, amen. So, we thank God for his grace and his mercy. So we close with this scripture, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's it right there. This thing should never be such a burden. I say, I don't think I can live this life. I don't think I can do it. Well, you're dependent on yourself to do it. But we can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. How many of you in your walk with God have had to go through some things you never thought you'd have to go through? And still somehow you came out okay on the other end. Hallelujah. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Amen. Any questions? Any comments? Yes. Another 10%. So you're talking about the law when you didn't give your tithe as your first fruit. You gave it to God. Then the law required you to add another 10% to it to give 20%. That's a fifth. Yeah, that's under the law. So, so let's just, just look at that real quick. Now, now, to do it with the right heart, right, to do it as you're growing in God, then... That would never happen because you're establishing that whenever I receive some increase, I immediately give 
the top portion, the first fruits of it to God. And this is why in the New Testament it tells us to be a cheerful giver. Not grudgingly, not because the law told you to. Not because someone says it's required of you. God, God is saying, no, I want you to give from your heart. See? It changes completely through the relationship that I love the Lord and I recognize that what I have received, God gave it to me. God blessed me with it. He gave me the ability to do the job. He gave me the work to do the job. He opened up the salary for me to do it or whatever it might be. That all came from God. So giving, giving the Lord his first fruits, it's not an issue. You did what? I'm sorry, I missed that. Okay. Okay. Did you do that because of conviction or you did that because you felt the law required it? Oh, well, we're not under the law. But, but that's you. If, if that's what you were led and felt to do, then you should do that. Okay? But God knows your heart. He knows your desire was to give the first to God anyway. And you would have done it if it would have worked out right. So that, that wasn't against your heart. Your heart was in the right place. You see what I'm saying? So God sees that. He saw that your heart was in the right place. And that's what we're being judged by, the heart. There's always going to be circumstances that may not, you know, get it immediately to God first fruits. But if your heart is there, you do the best to do that. So in that case, yeah. God knew your heart. Yeah. But hey, you want to give extra to the Lord? Praise God. God will bless you. Yes, Pastor Miz. Right. No. No. There you go. And so what does that show? Again, that shows the growth, right? That shows God bringing you into revelation. That happens through relationship. I love that. Right. I think I give as first fruit as possible because my tithes come out of my paycheck. How first fruit is that? Okay. I mean, I want to be in there right with Social Security at least, right? Whatever they take out, boom, Lord, you get yours first before I even see anything hit my bank account. Okay. So that's just, that's, that's how I do it. Amen. But, you know, yes. So that's a great, great point. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word today. And Lord, it's our desire, truly our desire, Lord, to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees as you have taught. Lord, help us to have that right heart before you so that we can do that, Lord, and that everything about our life is pleasing to you. Oh, God, if we have any motives that are wrong in our life, oh, God, bring us to a place of repentance and conviction that we get it right before you. We plead for your grace and mercy in those areas of our life. It's truly our desire, Lord, to be like you and to be citizens of your kingdom that are pleasing to you, for you are a great king and you deserve our very best. We thank you for your strength and help that we can do all things through you who strengthens us. Lord, bless the gift and the giver even on today for the offerings we give you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
and amen. Hallelujah. All right, y'all welcome to come back tonight, 6 o'clock. We're going to be in prayer for two hours from 6 to 8. Amen. We want to start saturating the sanctuary with prayer. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. We love you.